okay, so I'm going to be providing some background on the Collaborative Leadership Initiative or the CLI. Um, I will do so starting at kind of 10,000 feet and then hone in on a few of the focus areas that the CLI is working on. So kind of some CLI background to start, uh, and then I'll talk about our waste work first, uh, some of our work around water quality, uh, and then where we're thinking about going in the, the medium and long term as some of our next steps. So first, the CLI is a, it's a shared governance table that's been around since 2017. Um, originally started by a group of municipal and Indigenous leaders, grew in size to include 16 municipalities, uh, 11 First Nations, so those are mayors and reeves and chiefs, as well as Grand Chief Jerry Daniels from the Southern Chiefs Organization. And these communities, they're all kind of, I'll show you a map right away, they're all in uh, Southern Manitoba, typically clustered around Winnipeg. Um, but the leaders of these communities came together just under the recognition that they were dealing with a lot of similar challenges around waste and water, economic development, other things, and they didn't really have formal channels of communication. So SEER, along with the Winnipeg Metropolitan Region and the Southern Chiefs Organization, um, helped establish the CLI table back in 2017 um, and bring these leaders together and kind of establish a, a foundation for working together and for figuring out what regional solutions to these shared challenges look like. So this is the region, the CLI region, roughly. We don't have um, really firmly defined borders, um, but you can see it, it the, most of the communities are in and around the Winnipeg area. All of the municipalities are around Winnipeg. That's the Winnipeg metropolitan region. So um, the CLI includes 16 of the communities from the Winnipeg metro region, and that's Winnipeg and um, these dark gray spaces you see around the city. And then for First Nation communities that participate in the CLI, a lot of them are around Winnipeg as well. We also have some ones further out like Pine Creek and, and Swan Lake. Um, but generally what we say when we talk about the CLI region is this outer circle. So it's Winnipeg plus about 200 kilometers in every direction. And that's our, our focus area for the work that we do. So what's the CLI all about? How do they work together? Um, just a few important principles here. First, it's, it's really rooted in treaty relationships. So this has been, um, it's primarily treaty one and also including treaty two, but this has been a really important um, kind of grounding ethos for the group. Um, for example, that the treaty medal you see on the right was part of a, a signing ceremony in 2019 for a memorandum of understanding between all the different communities. And we actually struck treaty medals and each of the leaders is given a treaty medal is just symbolizing that importance. Um, also, as I mentioned, the regional approach is really the, the basis for coming together. It's regional solutions to share their challenges. Um, very action oriented group. So as, as I'll talk about in a bit, they spend quite a bit of time building relationships, getting that trust and understanding built up to be able to work together. Um, and now I've really focused on like, how can we achieve tangible impacts on the ground? The circular economy was identified early on as a really important principle uh, for these leaders. Um, so circular economy roughly is just um, kind of a more circular economic model in which less waste is generated and projects and products from the outset are designed to, to cycle back in and re reuse as much materials as possible and minimize waste production. So it's a big concept. It's getting a lot of traction and momentum around the world. It can sound a bit ivory tower sometimes, but what the CLI leaders is focused on is how to bring the circular economy to Manitoba and apply it to specific Manitoba challenges in the region. Um, and they have a, a list of priorities that they want to focus on really honed in on, on three big ones, which is economic development, water and land health, and infrastructure resiliency. So what have they done to date? Um, as I mentioned, a SEER in the first year, year and a half of the CLI, led the leaders through a, a structured reconciliation process. And what this was all about was building trust, kind of clearing up misconceptions, overcoming a long history of not really working together as much, um, and making sure that the relationships were in place uh, to have an effective shared governance table. So went through that process, uh, and then the leaders established a shared governance table. And as I mentioned, signed that Intergovernmental Memorandum of Understanding in 2019. And that's a really important uh, cornerstone for this initiative. It's a commitment to working together for at least the next five years. 
Uh, it outlines principles and parameters for working together and then areas of uh, common concern where the communities can collaborate. So that's really the, the foundational piece since 2019 of the CLI. Uh, also a lot of public engagement work. So social media website, there's actually a feature length um, CLI documentary, which is really fantastic and I can send out, um, but that's a good, if you're interested more in the CLI and how it started, that's a really good, uh, good way to get to know it and to get to know the people involved. And then as far as action on the ground, um, the CLI really focuses on, on two streams of action at the moment. And those are the ones I'll talk more about. So waste management, of course, um, as well as water quality. So waste management, I'll preface this by saying I just became involved in the, the waste aspect of CLI at the end of last year. Um, so I've had some catching up to do, not exactly a subject matter expertise, but I'm doing my best. Okay, so this will be a review for some of you folks, but um, the CLI communities identified shared regional waste management challenges as an important priority pretty early on. Um, and in early 2019, established the Quadrant Working Group's Solid Waste Initiative. And what this is, is um, CLI communities coming together, not as much at a leadership level, although sometimes at a leadership level, but more so staff members from the communities coming together, meeting and figuring out, um, well, exploring and considering regional approaches to improve solid waste management, figuring out where there's some issues of common interest that they can tackle together. And at the end of the day, increasing the region's solid waste diversion rate. Um, and one of the first things they did when they came together was uh, commissioning a study, a, a comprehensive regional study that looks at regional waste challenges, um, where there might be some opportunities for collaboration, and really just created a baseline of information that the group could work off of. So this has been an important document to, to guide the waste work. Here's how they work together. I mentioned quadrants a couple of times, I think, and this is roughly the quadrants and roughly the, the communities that participate in each one. It's, it's an organizational structure that's meant to make it more manageable across what's a big region that involves a lot of communities. And I should point out the, the waste initiative is CLI communities plus. So there's communities that aren't technically part of the CLI table that also participate, just kind of casting as wide of a scope for interested communities as possible. But it's broken down into these four quadrants. And so these boundaries you see on the screen are municipal boundaries. Um, and then First Nation communities either within those municipal boundaries or close to them, but really just trying to cluster uh, geographically close communities together in a way that makes sense um, so they can work together and there's a bit more synergy there. And so to date, it's been uh, a lot of collaboration and, and meeting and really taking action towards uh, some shared priorities. So you see in 2018, the, the waste rationalization feasibility study was produced. Since then, there's been the quadrant working groups have each been meeting individually. So um, four sets of meeting, one for each quadrant and figuring out how to move forward on the shared priorities, as well as some all quadrants meetings that have broader discussions and capacity building exercises and kind of gets everybody on the same foot from a regional perspective. But this is the content of the work to date. It's really been focused on woody waste. And woody waste was identified as a, a key opportunity in that initial waste rationalization study that looked at the region and said that basically woody waste is low hanging fruit that could be tackled by the communities in pretty short order. Um, also a great opportunity to divert waste from landfills to lower GHG emissions and air pollution and an opportunity to establish the, the regional service delivery model and enhance collaboration amongst the, the waste quadrant working group communities. And so it was identified in the report as you know, a key early opportunity and the communities agreed. And so all four quadrants, um, as well as the kind of regional whole are working on that woody waste challenge. And what that is, is that there's a lot of woody waste generated in the region on an annual basis. So 19, these are quite rough numbers, but around 19,000 tons generated annually across all four quadrants. That's not including city of Winnipeg. If you include city of Winnipeg, it's I think somewhere around 90,000. Um, but the vast majority of this woody waste is disposed of through open air burning. 
So that's either at um, a waste, a regulated waste depot or on private property, but most of it's burned and not used for any sort of uh, end use product. And so of course there's carbon emissions associated with that, there's air pollution challenges. And it's something that the, each of these individual communities identified an interest in addressing, but they have challenges doing so um, just due to size and capacity constraints. So the waste quadrant working groups are working on this challenge and the end goal is to eliminate burning of woody waste across the region, it's a big goal. Um, but the strategy is that, as I mentioned, these communities are, they range in size, but most of them are quite small, um, quite a big geographic area. So there's some distance between them. Um, and so to kind of create those economies of scale and to enhance capacity, the idea is that there could be a regional shared service contract um, in which uh, a servicer is hired who can go around collecting the woody waste or hauling shipping equipment to the communities. Um, and then instead of burning the woody waste at a landfill site, they would chip the woody waste um, and then it would be available for the First Nation community, the municipality to use um, for various purposes like trail building and things like that. Richard, can I ask a quick question? For sure. I can't remember, is woody waste defined just as um, like trees and shrubs or does that include like wood pallets, um, building debris that's not used, things like that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it, it could be all of those things. So we're focusing on uncontaminated woody waste and that's primarily uh, trees, branches, things like that. It could be pallets as long as they're not um, contaminated just for the, for the purposes of putting them in a chipper and for using the wood chips for end use product, we're focusing on the, the uncontaminated side of okay. it. So, and actually that's a good point because this estimate of 19,000 tons, that doesn't include wood from things like uh, renovations, construction and demos. It's just the, the uncontaminated wood waste. Okay, so essentially that means um, treated wood is contaminated wood, is that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Right, so, so the regional uh, service contract is identified as, as a good way forward and it's something that we've been exploring and um, kind of issued a, an introductory RFP to get some interest from different companies who could deliver the service. We did that last year. Some of the key challenges though um, to really moving forward with this are a lack of data. So you know, I gave you the 19,000 number, that is really rough. We don't have, typically communities don't keep data on how much wood waste they're accumulating and then burning every year. Um, so we've had to use some proxies and some secondary research to get to those numbers. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a scale question when we talk about hiring a, a local servicer to do regional work. We don't, actually don't know exactly how much we're talking about. So we need to put some work into that. Um, also for some communities, they're interested in what this could be, but because it's not been done, there's a lot of questions about Know, really on the ground, how can this work, that need to be answered. And so what the communities determined as a, a way to move forward is to do a pilot project. And that's with the communities, there's six of them at the moment who are most interested in and ready to move forward on a, a kind of a regional service contract. How those communities do a pilot um, in that way, we'll get better data and we'll demonstrate how this is gonna work on a smaller scale. Um, and then that can be a lesson and takeaways for, for the broader group, as well as for each of the, the waste quadrant working groups. So that's been agreed to as the next step. Um, and now what we need to do is finalize the pilot with those six communities and then get working on it. So SEER and WMR, are, and we are, we're working with a consultant named Mike Fernandez, are working with the, the interested communities to flesh out a uh, pilot project. And I should mention as well, those six are uh, five municipalities and, and one First Nation. I just wanted to, sure. sh can I share yeah, go ahead. a yes. little um, bit from Pegwis before we move on? Yeah. Um, during the um, landfill upgrade project for Pegwis, they had a massive mixed wood pile. Um, they, the consultant in that project was KGS Consulting. I can't remember who they contracted to do the chipping, um, but because it was mixed, they ended up using the, the wood as landfill cover. So I don't know if that's something to consider, like if there's possibility to separate 
good wood from bad wood, use some of it for um, path, making pathways and use some of it for landfill cover. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that's one of the, one of the data deficiencies is not knowing exactly not only how much volume is coming in, but what it's comprised of. So how much of it is contaminated wood, how much of it is uncontaminated, um, what, the, what the feasibility is of actually separating those, those types. Right. Um, but that's interesting because yeah, yeah, if you don't know or if you have contaminated wood, that seems like a good, good end use. I know that like KGS was able to estimate the volume of the size of the wood pile in Pegwis. So yeah. they might be able to give a little bit of like starting point to go do, off do you, of from their you, project there. Do you know how they did that? How they estimated the? Um, they used a drone and right, videoed right. and then whatever computer software they have. <laughs> okay, yeah, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Tavessi, do you have a question before we move on? Yeah, um, it almost looked like that then you need to determine uh, beforehand, what will be the end use of the product that comes out of that wood? And then you can decide as to how you're going to expand it. Because if you're talking about renovation painted wood, that can be used as a land cover. Uh, it's not going to be the same as uh, the type of uh, wood chips that you might uh, want to use uh, for landscaping. But once you determine, I think at the end use that it's acceptable is environmental friendly, then you could probably expand it uh, to take all kinds of uh, wood that uh, provided is viable to do so and uh, you have enough volume. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And I think it would, it would probably depend on the community as well. So I, I think it's something we could explore through the pilot is seeing what end use the community is interested in and then and then maybe tailoring our approach and, and our contract to do to deliver on those products. Yeah. Any other questions or comments at the moment? Do you have another one to Bessie? Are you okay? No. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah I just had a quick comment. I know that this is a situation that happened in the city but um, there was a tree that was cut and somebody left a stump in my front yard and there was a lot of concerns about Dutch elm disease um, and being able to regulate that uh, and they um, the city came through and tagged it and they actually fined us because they were worried that we were going to be uh, using that for cover of some sort. So I wonder if that is a concern. I'm not aware of Dutch elm disease situation outside of the city, but I know that's been pretty pressing in within the Winnipeg boundaries. Yeah, that's a, also a really good question. Our consultants are actually doing a bit more research on that. We, it's like a series of question marks in our briefing note because we're not sure what, how disease wood can be used, if at all. Um, I think our inclination right now is that as long as it's not moved off site it and that kind of makes sense right like if it's not moved off site it shouldn't really matter as much um but yeah we're still still working to determine um, whether we can include diseased wood or not because that would that would change the scope a bit there's also if i could just add to that comment there's a you there's quite a big difference in in uh a wood stump that is potentially still alive and dead wood chips. And so far, scientists have been saying that uh, diseases do not spread, or it's very unlikely that diseases spread through the through wood chips. Now, obviously, that still means that we're super careful and we don't want to spread it. And it's probably best if it stays in the community. But yeah, that's the general statement. Okay. Um, so the final piece of this on waste is uh, some work that we've been doing recently uh, in collaboration with WMR, and that is supported a lot of this work as well, um, which is really tying the waste priority to the, the circular economy principles that is mentioning that the CLI leaders want to focus on. Um, so to do this work, we've, and WMR is leading it with serious support. Um, we partnered with a, actually a Dutch firm called Metabolic, um, and they're Kind of leaders in the circular economy and 
and importantly, really bringing the, the circular economy ideas into practical on the ground solutions. Um, so some of you may have been at the conference last Thursday. We had a conference on the circular economy, um, three hours virtual, um, looking at uh, possible implementation of circular economy on the ground in Manitoba. So that was really great, well attended and well received. And, and thanks to ISC support, actually, we were able to support the participation of First Nation communities in that conference. So that was really great. Um, and we're still working with Metabolics. So they helped deliver that conference. Um, they're also gonna be looped into some of the waste quadrant meetings that are happening in March. And so at those meetings, we'll be finalizing the wood waste pilot and moving forward with that. And you can imagine that kind of branching off with the interested communities is a separate stream of work. Um, but then the next priority that the larger group has determined they want to focus on is organic waste diversion. And so that's yeah the next focus area. And we'll kind of take a similar approach to what we did for waste, which is first getting a baseline understanding of uh, where communities are at for organic waste diversion and where they might want to go. Um, we have the advantage this time of consulting with Metabolic and seeing what they can offer in terms of concrete opportunities based on their expertise. Um, and then figuring out and maybe scoping some pilot um, projects for what organic waste diversion might look like with the quadrant working groups. So that's kind of the next step of work. Um, and that's all I have for waste. I'll also talk about the, the water quality work we're doing, but I just wanted to pause here and, and see if there's any questions or comments or folks wanna have a discussion about the waste stuff before I move on. Angela, just so you know, the two pilot project outlines there will be part of the final reporting that we're doing for 1055. So this is work that will be completed by the end of March. Okay, great. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering how are, uh, how's the CLI and I guess maybe WMR considering ongoing participation? Like how are they gonna help continue you know, bringing First Nations to the table is, is funding still required going forward or are First Nations able just to participate um, on their own without assistance? Yeah, so it, definitely COVID has, has made that more challenging moving everything to virtual um, and communities being very strapped for capacity. Um, but largely um, communities have been able to participate, especially the leadership level, um, just participate in the meetings um, without a lot of financial support. That said, we have had kind of convening and organizing support from, from Environment Canada and, and Winnipeg Foundation and a few others. Um, but, and a lot of our, I'll get into this in the water quality stuff, but um, the funding that we're, we're seeking now is really supporting the project oriented work of the CLI. We're finding that as we move forward with the shared governance table, um, communities are taking on more of the work themselves, doing things like hosting meetings themselves um, at their own expense because they see the value in the CLI. Um, and that's kind of the model as well, long term, is that, you know, we don't need to be around forever and we don't need to be securing funding forever to secure communities participation. Um, that said, and especially for the circular economy stuff, um, we did need to, to support First Nation participation just because it is more challenging right now. Uh, than other times. Thank you. Devesi? Yeah, I just wonder, um, the areas that uh, you still don't have uh, information, there is information gaps, uh, so are you, on the basis of what you, you have analyzed so far, is there a need uh, to continue collecting the information that is missing that you think is uh, gonna be valuable going forward? Yeah, that would help a lot. Um, we, we, have, we have a number of data gaps. So specifically for woody waste, the, the pilot will help address this and we'll get real numbers from the communities who are participating in, in wood waste volume produced. Um, but that'll just be for the participating communities and we'll have to use that to kind of extrapolate as proxies for other communities. Um, but I'm sure with the organics work, we know we're gonna run into data gaps there as well. So, I mean, there's another piece of this, which is, you know, taking that concrete action, but then also having the, the knowledge base to do so in a really effective way. Um, so it's, yeah, it's something we have to look at as well. 
So when you're saying uh, finalize a woody waste a pilot, mm -hmm. uh, what are you talking about? I, I think it's a good idea that you're looking at pilot, maybe not at the larger scale, but uh, if, if individual community have a specific uh, projects that they need to pilot, uh, that might be something useful as well. Is that what you're referring to? Or is, is, is at this level is still a, a sort of a planning concept and not at the project level? Yeah, so we're looking to move to the project level. We, we actually, we kind of issued a call for proposals and um, we had three presentations in January at our waste quadrant meetings from different service providers who could provide the wood shipping service on a regional scale. Um, and those were all good. They all had the, the capacity to do so. But on both sides, both on the community side and the service provider side, there was a lot of questions about volume and what this actually looks like and, and those sorts of things. So it was determined that a smaller pilot would be useful um, for communities that are really rearing to go and they're at that readiness stage to figure out what this actually looks like on the ground, what the cost is for, for hauling and shipping the woody waste. And, yeah. and then, you know, approximate numbers on what's being produced as well. And then eventually the idea is take the lessons from that and scale it up regionally. Yeah, um, I think that's, yeah, that, that might be a good approach eh, to just scale it down at the pilot level, just looking at it uh, in smaller chunks as you move along because it'll, it'll certainly generate quite a good information. I attended uh, uh, the quadrant. I, I just uh, didn't check when you were put in the map, but the one that included uh, Rosso River uh, uh -huh. in the meeting, and uh, it sounded like uh, the Hampa wood ship in one of the RMs, and uh, they were just basically struggling, I guess, uh, in terms of uh, what volume do we have and how do we count it in order to maximize uh, the use of that wood chip uh, once uh, they've collected all the, the wood that they have, but uh, they were struggling with that as well. But I haven't followed up uh, to see where they are at in trying to determine the volume that are uh, within that region. Yeah, and um, the, the volume question is something that each of the service providers who presented to the communities um, propose different ways to address. So it'd be part of the pilot design would be things like uh, drones and, and mm -hmm. different methods to estimate volume. So we could get a better handle on that because we don't have, we just have proxies to go on right now. So Richard, can you, Richard, can you confirm that then at the end of the pilot, which will be done at the end of March, that there, there currently isn't funding secured for those continue, those communities to continue doing woody waste work, like to have that service. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. Okay. Okay, so then the pilot would essentially, it, it comes to an end and then more funding would need to be found in order to continue the woody waste work. Yeah, it's an open question at this point and something communities ask about that we don't have a great answer to, which is what level of support is going to be available for the pilot communities and you know ideally as with the CLI writ large this is something that eventually the communities are going to take and run with on their own mm -hmm. but it's pretty clear for this initial pilot at least that they're going to need continuing support um, so we do need to secure additional resources to provide that support yeah yeah okay any other questions about the waste aspect so uh, yeah, just one last question the sure. community that are participating how were they selected that uh, this were the community that were willing volunteering because i noticed uh, in one of them you have uh, takura chipi and uh, but i didn't see long plane and takura planes uh, which are just neighbors and i'm sort of uh, curious as to how they was it an invitation and uh, whoever responded and wanted to volunteer to work together, <laughs> was it the basis? Yeah, you know what, it's a good question because the groups came together before my time at SEER, but I can say yeah. that it's, um, it includes all of the CLI communities as well as a number of other communities that are generally in the region. So Long Plain, Dakota TB, they're, they're included as well. And we send out the invitation 
as broadly as possible to this to this broader list and participation is just self-selected based on community interest um, and kind of where they're at with their their waste work and how much of a priority that is for them oh okay yeah Amy, you have a question? Um, yeah. I'm wondering if you can expand more on the plans for the organic waste diversion on what the pilot might look like. Yeah, no yeah. idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah, we, uh, we're we going to have a session in early March, with which Metabolic is helping us out with. And that's really a scoping session. So it's talking to the participants in the working groups and seeing where they're at and where they might want to go. Um, and providing some ideas for them on that basis. Okay. Uh, but we, we don't know. It's the same thing we did with, with, with Woody Waste at the beginning, which is starting with these broad conversations and then narrowing the scope over time. Right. Yeah. Um, just yeah. making sure you're aware that the province has a composting coordinator okay. position. Her name is Kelly Couric. She used to um, be the general manager of Compost Winnipeg for Green Action Center. Okay. Okay, interesting. Is that a newer position or? Uh, I think she's been in the position for a year, maybe a little more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's great. We should definitely connect with her. So what, uh, what's the mandate of that position, Amy? Um, good question. <laughs> Support composting programs in the province of Manitoba. Yes, yeah, so the province has a, a fund which can help support organics and composting. Uh, so I think she oversees the funding and the application process with that and then just helps communities uh, deal with composting also. So yeah, she's a good resource. That's a good uh, call, Amy. She has um, a lot of personal experience developing mm -hmm. composting programs and has taken all of the training through the Compost Council of Canada, I believe. Yeah. So is it a focus at the community level or can it be uh, institution within the community like uh, schools, uh, the nursing, nursing health center or the gaming center? Is it targeted at the community level or can it uh, be broken down into mm -hmm. those smaller groups? The funding? Yeah, the support, whatever support is uh, provided there. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I'm guessing it would be more the community level. Um. Because what we are realizing in some community, the driver is uh, those small entities mm -hmm. before it eventually, you know, the entire community come together to accept it. But we find that uh, in some cases, uh, it's certainly driven by schools, right? Uh, the gaming center, they take that uh, leadership role uh, before it actually would expand to the community. And so they may be struggling then with expanding once it takes on <clears throat> to, uh, to take in more. So it might be uh, a question of how assistance uh, could actually be provided for them as a, uh, a way of uh, providing a seed money, you might say, mm -hmm. from a little small scale to, to sort of expand and bring awareness mm -hmm. to the entire community. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, starting at an institutional scale within communities as a way of kind of just demonstrating how it works. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll, I'll betray my ignorance a little bit here, but um, I know WMR, to support their side of this, they are getting provincial funding from somewhere. It might be from the organics fund. I'm not 100% sure. So, um, Great. yeah. Uh, Richard, sorry, um, I, I'm looking for my hand to hands <laughs> up. I could not find it. So, <laughs> this works. <laughs> sorry, um, question though. No, thanks for this. Um, at the end though, could you share your presentation with us? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. No, oh, just saying to Angela, that's all I'm asking. Thanks. Okay, yeah, we'll do. At um, a little more about composting and a little bit to tiny, tiny bit promotion for Green Action Center. Mm -hmm. We have a pretty well developed uh, um, program for like backyard or small scale composting, and um, the composting department program does something called a master composter um, course 
every year or two, depending on funding. So if there's like schools or um, just smaller, smaller groups that want to start composting, that's mm -hmm. probably a good route. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Is that, and that's delivered outside the city as well? Yeah. And I have a master composter training, so. That's if you good have to know. It's about composting. I can help you. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's great to know, Amy, because if we're if you know moving forward, Richard starts exploring some of these opportunities, and there's a need for some training, then you know, hopefully, we can partner with you, and maybe there's an opportunity to get some funding from the province, and mm -hmm. at least start mm -hmm. to kind of raise that awareness and understanding around composting. For sure. Yeah. Very cool. Do you want to move on to move on to water? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, another world we're opening up. Here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's the waste work, and as I mentioned, that's one of two kind of main action streams of the CLI. Um, the other one, and actually the one that that I work a lot more on than I do waste, is water quality. And so, this was also identified very early by the CLI leaders as something they wanted to focus on. And specifically what they want to focus on is saving Lake Winnipeg and reducing nutrient loading in the lake and the algal blooms that villas produce. Um, and so that's really been the focus of, of this work for, well, since I've been on board at, at least. Um, and so you're probably all quite aware of the, of the challenge, but really high level, what it breaks down to is the Lake Winnipeg basin is massive there's nutrients flowing into the lake um, and primarily phosphorus that's causing the the algal blooms on the lake and they're flowing from a massive area and from a lot of non-point sources that are hard to regulate and, and hard to mitigate because there's so many of them and it's largely agricultural land um, and so it's a big area it's a really complex ecological problem it's a really complex governance problem um, but where the cli uh, table has an advantage is if you look at the map on the right hand side here, this is a, a big phosphorus uh, hotspot and this is also the region where the CLI is focused. Um, so Winnipeg and surrounding area, um, you know, phosphorus is coming in from all over the watershed, but that is, that is a hotspot. And so there's an opportunity there um, to achieve meaningful outcomes on the ground as well as to kind of demonstrate how it can be done in other places in the basin. So too much phosphorus is the challenge um, from a bunch of different sources and, and a lack of coordination. And the CLI leaders identified this as something they wanted to focus on. And they pinpointed specifically natural infrastructure or nature-based solutions um, as uh, an avenue for addressing nutrient loading and specifically as a way to address nutrient loading across a big area and across a bunch of non-point sources. So the vision of the CLI leaders is to establish uh, a, a network of large scale natural infrastructure projects across the region. Um, and when I say natural infrastructure, I'm talking about things like wetlands, uh, stream bank vegetation, vegetated lagoon systems, basically any natural process that's effective at removing phosphorus from the water. Um, and they want this network to be established across the region, eventually across the watershed to help really offset the amount of nutrients that are going in from those non-point sources, so largely agricultural land. Um, and, you know, natural infrastructure and nature-based solutions is a concept that's gaining a lot of momentum and has a lot of attention right now. Um, there's a lot of benefits. There's lower costs than, than gray traditional infrastructure. It also, in addition to improving water quality, you know, think about the benefits that accrue from something like a wetland. It also provides habitat. Uh, sequesters carbon, stores more water on the landscape, which is really important for a lot of these rural communities to reduce the impacts of flood and drought. Um, and yeah, it's lower cost. So, so there's a lot of benefits here. Um, on paper, it's a really easy sell, actually. But one of the challenges is that there's not a lot of dedicated funding for natural infrastructure at the moment. And there's not a lot of incentive for, for communities and landowners to build natural infrastructure projects. And so the kind of innovative uh, financial mechanism that the leaders have identified to help spur more natural infrastructure projects in the region is water quality trading. And so that's the 
it's a, that's the project in its entirety. It's developing a water quality trading program to incentivize a network of natural infrastructure. Um, and so you may have heard of water quality trading. It's, it's a lot more common actually in the States than it is in Canada um, because the Environmental Protection Agency in the States has been prom promoting it for a long time. But what it is uh, kind of at its most basic level is the equivalent of a carbon credit trading system for water. Uh, so it's building natural infrastructure. So something like a wetland and then measuring how much phosphorus that when wetland actually reduces from the water. And then based on how effective it is at reducing phosphorus, it generates a certain amount of credits. So there's credits associated with that specific project. And then the idea is that you have folks who are gonna build these projects and reduce phosphorus. And then the market part of it is you have potential buyers who are willing to pay to see improvements in water quality. And from what we've seen in other water quality trading programs that the buyers vary a lot. They could be governments, uh, industry, civil society, individuals who are just really invested in environmental outcomes and looking for a place to put their money and their energy. Who will then purchase those credits and that then you know funds the system, helps incentivize natural infrastructure, and then it uh, perpetuates over time. So that's the kind of high level explanation of water quality trading. One of the big challenges with it is that when you get into the details, as you can imagine, it gets quite complex. You need an administrative body to, to run the system. Um, some argue that you need regulation, but the, it does get quite complex, but this is the idea um, and what we're working toward right now. And it, it has also been well received and generated a lot of momentum. So we've been able to secure funding from uh, a bunch of different sources to support the water quality trading work specifically and, and the natural infrastructure piece of it. So uh, various provincial departments and entities, Environment Canada is continuing to fund the CLI table and water quality trading work. Um, we're partnering with some academic partners and some civil society partners and also some private donors to, to try and make this project happen. And I'll just briefly explain uh, the actual steps that we're taking to try and get water quality trading off the ground. Um, so there's four, uh, you'll see them here. I won't talk about outreach and engagement too much. That's just our ongoing communication piece through the CLI tables, um, but I'll explain each of the other three uh, just to give you a sense of where we're at and, and where we're gonna be heading this year and beyond. So this is a really key piece of it. This is a natural infrastructure pilot projects. Um, and it's, it's akin in some ways to the you know, the waste pilot that we're doing, which is that this all sounds really great on paper and on paper communities are interested, but there's a lot of interest also in seeing what this actually looks like on the ground and having that proof of concept to show that, yeah, natural infrastructure does reduce phosphorus and it does, you know, have those co benefits. Um, so we're working with CLI communities to build four small scale natural infrastructure projects. Um, the goal is to build one in each quadrant. So you'll see the, the quadrants again here in this map uh, and to have two projects that are municipal led and two that are first nation led, but that'll have like lessons and takeaways for the whole group. And these projects so far, we're still in discussion about what exactly they're gonna look like, but so far uh, we're exploring ideas like water retention and wetland projects. Um, vegetative lagoons is turning out to be a pretty popular option. So the idea that you can have aquatic plants in your lagoon that remove phosphorus from the water before you discharge it. And then you can harvest those plants and then use them as uh, compost or some other end use. Um, so we're exploring options there. But really what the conversations are around is um, developing projects, small scale pilot projects that are locally led. And so what that means is we have a mandate and funding to um, build natural infrastructure projects that reduce phosphorus. We're also working with communities to say, that's our mandate. What, what do you wanna see? What are you interested in um, for projects of this type? And that might be, yeah, we're interested in additional services in our lagoon. Um, we have erosion problems in our community. So a stream bank stabilization project makes the most sense for us. And so we're having those discussions to make sure that whatever we build is, is beneficial for, for all and meets community needs. Um, and then another part of it is as with the CLI generally, is leveraging local resources. 
So we have Sierra secured some funding through the CLI to support these projects. Um, not a huge amount of money. So what we're also looking for is um, communities to, to participate, to provide in-kind equipment and, and staff time and to take ownership of the projects. And so those are the conversations we're having as we look to scope these and, and look to start construction this summer, this spring and summer. So that's a big piece of it. Um, another big piece of it is actually looking at how to design water quality trading. As I mentioned, it gets fairly complex, um, but we have uh, signed a contract with the Electric Power Research Institute out of the States um, to do a feasibility study. And EPRI is, we're very fortunate to be working with them. They're a world leader in water quality trading. Um, they operate one of the biggest water quality trading programs in the world in the Ohio River Basin. And they just have a ton of expertise in getting these things off the ground. So we're working with them. Uh, they're doing a feasibility study that is looking at legislative and regulatory analysis, um, watershed analysis, so some hydrological modeling, um, ecotypes, looking at effective types of natural infrastructure for the CLI region. Um, and then at the end of the day, providing concrete recommendations for what a water quality trading program could look like. Sorry, I'll back up. Whether a water quality trading program is right for the CLI region um, or that doesn't need to be altered or modified or called something else. And then specifically what, what will look like, what do we need to make happen, um, to implement water quality trading in the region. So this study is ongoing and is, is slated to be done in May of this year. And the last piece I'll touch on is, um, it's a smaller part of it, but it's, it's an important part of it is that we've secured a bit of funding through the CONAP fund at the university of Toronto to work with uh, a landscape architect and two graduate students uh, to do a study that's looking at something that as far as we can tell hasn't really been done before, which is principles and practices and processes for ensuring that uh, indigenous knowledge and community knowledge is really meaningfully incorporated and mainstreamed into the design of natural infrastructure projects and the construction. And so we have this research partnership with uh, these University of Toronto folks, and they're providing the landscape architect expertise, which is awesome. A lot of mapping work, a lot of illustrations of different natural infrastructure projects. Um, and we're also planning some workshops with communities at the end of the month um, to, to talk about you know, different types of plants, different type of natural areas and cultural values on the land that can help shape the, the design and construction of natural infrastructure projects. And so we hope to come out of that, once again, with some recommendations for how we can make sure that we're doing this all the time moving forward, especially as we look to scale up uh, the natural infrastructure to a, to, a, to a bigger area. And that work is scheduled to be done in April. Um, so a few things converging at once here. Uh, so I'll just, I just have one more slide. I'll, I'll finish that off and then we can, we can have a chat. Um, but yeah, these are the next steps for the CLI. So just to reiterate for, for waste, we are looking to develop and initiate the Woody Waste Pilot, um, getting that started in spring of this year and scoping a pilot project for organics diversion as well. For the water work, uh, we'll be concluding those, that feasibility study and that indigenous knowledge study in spring. Um, we hope to start construction on the natural infrastructure pilot projects in summer of this year, and then doing monitoring and, um, and site visits and promoting those projects once they're built. Uh, and then after that, and based on the results of the feasibility study, primarily determining what, what a water quality trading program looks like in the CLI region, and then how we can operationalize that. And so that's a pretty big, pretty big task, but that's on the radar. Um, and then something I haven't mentioned yet at all, but has been identified as a, a next focus area by CLI leaders. Um, and that something, if you think about the circular economy principles fits in pretty well with water and waste work that we're doing, but that's around food security. Um, so we're, we haven't even started those discussions really. We need to start those discussions at the CLI leadership table, um, but that's been identified as, as an area for future work as well. And that is the CLI. So happy to, to move to a discussion period.
folks are interested.